I'm real pleased to be with you this evening. I thank you for being here. We'll have a good time, and we will go until such time as either you're ready to quit or they throw us off the stage. <laughs> I only have about uh, 45 minutes worth of presentation material, but I hope I will generate a con enough controversy and enough questions in that period that uh, we can enter into dialogue. I, I enjoy the dialogue, I enjoy interacting, and I think that uh, I think that we both, we all benefit much better when we do it that way. Now, just to get in to the, this program a bit, the reason I changed things around, I see John Alexander sitting out there, and he made some uh, remarks yesterday that I wanted to pick up on here. So we'll start with those. Let me get this slide going. And he put up his first one of his slides yesterday to talk about all the nasty things that people can say when they disagree with you and why science has uh, uh, fought the things we're talking about for so long. And that was the title of his slide. And he also uh, uh, pointed out, as I said, the nasty things said about him and about all of us. So, and the title of that slide was ad hominem. So if we move on to today, <laughs> I can point out some of the things that have been said about me as a result of being interested in this area and being associated with this sort of thing. And one of the first things they used to say 30 years ago, he got lost in space. And the second thing is, well, he's just a space cadet. And then some of them, uh, some of my colleagues who had worked with me for a while and still didn't quite know quite how to take me into how to take all of this stuff. Uh, something strange happened out there, but he's too bright to argue with. But he sure has a lot of a weird facts that he throws at you. <clears throat> well, that one came along. And then when I came out with the way of the explorer here five years ago, Kirkus Reviews although other people gave me good when Kirkus Reviews said he's trying to reinvent the wheel. And we're starting to talk about how does science and mystical experience fit together. But then the crowning put down of all, which I'm sure many of us have experienced, is just another bunny hugger. <laughs> so that fits a lot of us, I think. But what we're going to talk about tonight, one of the things I wanted to point out to you before we get going vis-a-vis -vis that last slide we had up of all the nasty things people say and try to reject the ideas we've been putting out. First of all, why would a nice guy like me would they say things about, like that about? And that's because something strange did happen in space. It was the opportunity to see the universe and see the world from a different perspective. They say travel broadens. <laughs> Getting on a a mountaintop broadens, it gives you a different point of view. Well, being able to look at Earth from an ET perspective uh, was pretty wow. Let me tell you a little bit about it because it did get this whole thing started with me. It was the peak experience, the Eureka experience, uh, an epiphany that uh, made me realize I had to change the way I was thinking. Now remember at that time, I was a qualified Navy test pilot. I'd been in the Navy uh, 17, about almost 17 years at that time. <clears throat> Had a PhD from MIT on aeronautics and astronautics. And about as linear left brain thinking as you could get. <clears throat> but also, in the years, few years before, I'd become interested in J.B. Ryan's work at Duke and had been studying parapsychological literature. And uh, with just a few weeks to go before the flights, some uh, physician friends, two physician friends of mine, and I said, you know, it'd be awfully nice to find out if this telepathy stuff worked at 200,000 miles, since nobody had had that opportunity before. So we cooked up an ad, ad hoc experiment, which most of you already know about, in order to test that out. 
However, that wasn't the high point. That was just another thing to do. <clears throat> but on the way home, after that was done, <clears throat> after the work on a lunar surface was done, which was wonderful to be an explorer and to go where humans have never been, to set foot on another planet, <clears throat> and then to come home after a successful mission. And the unexpected happened. Looking at Earth like this, this tiny little blue ball, looking about twice the size that a full moon looks when you look at it from here. <clears throat> looking at the stars behind and being awestruck by all of this. I suddenly realized from my MIT training and star formation and galactic formation and so forth, <clears throat> The molecules of this body and the molecules of that spacecraft and my partners had been prototyped in an ancient generation of stars. Okay, that's the way it is. But all of a sudden, those were my molecules we were talking about. And it wasn't an intellectual exercise, it was just suddenly damn deeply personal. And <clears throat> it was a feeling experience, it wasn't an intellectual experience. And I suddenly realized that in a way we in science didn't understand, the universe was intelligent, interconnected, and that our modeling of answering the question, who are we and how do we get here, was incomplete and flawed. <clears throat> and that from our cultural cosmologies, coming out of religion, they were archaic and flawed. And now as a spacefaring civilization, the beginning is a spacefaring civilization, we needed to have a new story about ourselves and a new answer to the question, who are we, how did we get here, and where we're going. What was interesting was that was accompanied by an ecstasy, a wow, an aha, a eureka. And the question to my linear left brain scientific mind was, okay, what kind of a mind brain is this that causes looking at the universe or looking at the world from different perspectives have this sort of euphoric feeling. <clears throat> it wasn't until I got back, curious about this, left NASA a year or so later because it was obvious I wouldn't fly again until the shuttle and I didn't want to fly a desk for 10 years. So one of the first things I did was with some meager funds commissioned to research and we started digging through the ancient mystical literature because <clears throat> neurology and psychology had nothing to say about what was going on. But I needed to understand and thought maybe the mystical literature would help me understand something. And I discovered in digging through the literature <clears throat> that what had happened in space had a name in the ancient Sanskrit called the Salvakapa Samadhi experience, where you see things in their separateness, but you feel them in their connectedness, accompanied by euphoria. So, wow, found something new, didn't know about. That was enough to start me on a 30 years task in founding the Institute of Noetic Sciences. <clears throat> to have a mechanism by which we could address with new eyes and new science or new methodology the question of consciousness. What is it? How did it come to be? Why is it like it is? Because since for the last 400 years, since Rene Descartes with his famous pronouncement of the separation of mind and body, physicality and spirituality, science and the church have pr proceeded along their individual paths with a minimum of interaction with a tacit agreement to stay out of each other's backyard. <clears throat> but quantum science, at the beginning of this century, has thrown those two backyards and torn down the fence between them, and we needed to start looking from a scientific perspective of what is the nature of consciousness and why are these experiences like they are. Anyhow, we spent 30 years Many of you out here have spent equally long in some aspect of that study or another, 
Many of you already know that uh, Russell Targ and Hal Putoff and I go back uh, to the early 70s at SRI when we were working Brendan O'Regan and <clears throat> working in the next office who later became the Institute of Nordic Sciences Research Director and Willis Harmon was there at the same time and we were doing the work with Uri Geller and all of us interested in these types of events. What I want to show you tonight <clears throat> is some work that I have been doing for the last few years since the mid-90s, since The Way of the Explorer first came out, in quantum holography. <clears throat> and from my opinion, it is a powerful discovery, and I think you'll see why as we go through, that has the potential, which I believe will be realized over the next decade or so, <clears throat> as we dot all the I's, cross all the T's, and find how this discovery fits in to the picture that we've been trying to create. Now, I know some of the old timers in here, uh, 30 years ago, we've agreed, 30 years ago, we were all over the map trying to propose theories and ideas. How does consciousness, remote viewing, parapsychology, how does all this fit? What's the science behind it? And we had all had our pet theories and they were all like this. 30 years later, we circumscribed the problem. It's coming in together pretty well. Uh, do we have good solid answers? No. We think we have some pretty good ones. We think it's narrowing. We think we're getting a handle on it. <clears throat> we think we're making better sense than we ever have. But we have to remember that our models are never complete until they've been tested and the anomalies and the bugs flushed out and we try to see if there's anything, trying to disprove our own theory. That's what good science is about, trying to falsify your own concepts to see if they can stand the test of time. So I'm going to present to you some work tonight called quantum holography, or a quantum hologram. Heart per pertains to remote viewing and then on beyond to a number of other interesting implications that come from this. Buckminster Fuller, and you know who Bucky Fuller is, he coined the phrase Spaceship Earth back in the 60s, was uh, uh, credited with saying, we're the crew of Spaceship Earth and we're in mutiny. So he recognized the problems back then. I was privileged at one time to give a series of Buckminster Fuller lectures after his death, and uh, that was a high part one of the high points of my lecture series, my lecture career. But he's accredited with the saying, if you want to understand the human condition, you must first understand the universe. But from the mystical point of view, and any great mystic will say, if you want to understand the universe, you must first understand the self. And what I've learned is that they're both right. Because from all the modern evidence, we seem to live in a universe that is self-organizing, intelligent, creative learning, interactive, participatory, evolving, and now we recognize it's a quantum system. And a large part of what I'll be talking about tonight, thank you, Paul. A large part of what I'll be talking tonight <clears throat> about tonight is the newly discovered some newly discovered quantum aspects of that evolving macroscopic system we call the universe. So, to really understand any of it, if we take those two paradoxical statements at face value, we really under need to understand it all. And in order to understand it all, we must examine theorize, critique, and validate each of the parts. And that, of course, is what science is supposed to do in its most idealized form. But we're all quite recognized that science has its politics, its detractors, its uh, just human beings, after all, with the same motivations, failings, and faults as the rest of us. So science is no more a pure system 
than is politics. And sometimes I think it's even worse because it has its own brand of politics. But we want to talk about the quantum hologram. What is it not? Let's define what we're not going to talk about tonight. Could it not within this notion? It's not about a holographic universe. From all evidence, the universe is not a hologram. It's a very real material structure. And it's not about a new kind of subtle energy. Because subtle energy research is very powerful. But this relates to it in a very strong way. And it's not about multi-dimensional theories. And I'll show you why or tell you why as we get on through here. But it is about information. It's about nature's basic information system, which we've only just discovered in the last few years and begin to start to understand it. Now, <clears throat> Elizabeth Rauscher talked on some of the notions the other day, in which I'm going to pull in here, and you will see them <clears throat> perhaps in a slightly different form, but we're converging on the same ideas. We're also asking the question, because information is the basis of how we know whatever it is we know. Think of it in this fashion. <clears throat> we think we know. The question is, <clears throat> how do we know anything? Well, the word that we use in modern parlance is information. Information is just patterns of energy. Whether it's those letters up there, whether it's the stars of the sky, and the names of the constellations that the ancients gave to them, they're patterns that we give meaning to. Information is just patterns of energy. And whether it's in molecular form or whether it's in the form of light and whether it's in just those patterns upon the wall, those are patterns of energy to which we give meaning. And that's why we know anything at all, because we can process information. Intelligence, a fine definition of intelligence, is the ability to process, manage, utilize information. So it's a very general, basic, fundamental definition that I want us to keep in mind. What we're going to see here and what comes out of this, whereas in quantum physics in this century and classical physics for 300 years before, the fundamental notions of physics is about energy and matter. What these developments I'm talking to you about does <clears throat> is to elevate the concept of information to a par with energy in physics. Now, this isn't universally accepted, but when all of the ramifications of what we're going to talk about tonight are brought forth, examined, critiqued, peer-reviewed, and argued, I'm sure that we will now be thinking that information is as fundamental in physics as energy itself. Now, I have to stop a minute and give a caveat here on something. I'm talking to you about things tonight, many of which there are several new papers have been written just in the last several months as breaking developments have taken place. My colleagues and I, mostly in Europe, who have been working on these processes, have written at least a half a dozen or so papers over the last uh, two or three years, <coughs> uh, which have been in peer-reviewed journals and uh, but mostly in Europe. Much of what I'm going to touch upon tonight is not yet in final, finalized form. It's been peer reviewed, but it has not yet been printed. So I can only speak a little judiciously about some of the concepts until that is done. And the film that we're, they're doing back there of this talk cannot be released for another year until we get all of the paper work done and protect the very people that are doing much of the very, very hard work. 
So I'm titillating and teasing you with some information tonight that can't really become fully official and fully explained in the math and the physics and the experimental evidence fully revealed until the papers are written. However, that's the way it goes. Okay. <clears throat> Quantum holography, it does seem to provide a very powerful model to explain certain things you've already talked about. John Alexander pointed out about Sheldrake's morphogenetic field. The quantum hologram looks like it is the mechanism that provides the information that Sheldrake talked about. It looks like it is quite germane in understanding Benavista's water memory. And you can, we can talk about that a bit later. It certainly is germane in trying to understand why remote viewing telepathy works. We can even create a good model for reincarnation with this notion. We've recently created a very viable learning cosmology for the organization of the universe using this model. And I'll point out to you near the end of this talk, we've come up with a new theory of perception, which has already been written up. <clears throat> uh, that's quite different than than the theory, of, uh, classical theory of perception. It also gives us very strong clues to PK. <clears throat> and we'll discuss that a bit, a little bit later as to why that is true. And perhaps it can help us really understand in a process, a feedback loop, of why consciousness itself works, how it works, how it came to be, and why it is like it is. So, what's a quantum hologram? <clears throat> First of all, it's rooted in the absorption emission phenomena. <clears throat> Let me explain what that is for those that don't know. And I know we have a few physicists in here and mathematicians that do understand, but in general, let's tell what it is. All matter at the molecular level emits and reabsorbs quanta of energy spontaneously. And we're kind of illustrating that. So that if you were to look at any bit of matter, whether that's chair, this podium, our bodies, whatever, physical matter is emitting at the molecular level quanta of energy and reabsorbing it. That's a well-known, accepted fact. It's been around since the beginning of quantum mechanics for 75 years. No real problem or question about that. But, <clears throat> It's rooted in absorption emission. It's derived from the standard quantum formalism of the Heisenberg Lie group algebra. Now that's for the mathematicians and physicists in the room. Here is the kicker. The discovery a few years ago by Dr. Walter Schell and Ernst Benz in Germany, that those emissions are coherent and carry information. And that's a wow. That's a wow. Very, very profound when you start to look further at what the meaning of all of that is. It has been validated in the laboratory initially with MRI tomography. All of you are familiar with MRI machines. Probably many of you have been on one. Shimp turned out <coughs> is an MRI expert working to improve MRI machines to get greater specificity, less invasiveness. <clears throat> In other words, to get a clear picture from MRI machines. And he came up with the formalism of the quantum hologram and realized by working with the MRI machines, that's what he was dealing with, this thing called the quantum holo holography, and started working on it. Our, my other colleague, Peter Marsher, I'll tell you this little story. Peter Marsher, who was at CERN, is now semi-retired in England, lecturing and writing and doing research, <coughs> uh, freelance mostly. Uh, he was a mathematical physicist at CERN. And he and Schimpf were working on computing machines, quantum computers. And they were using much of this 
advanced theory and structure. And Peter Marser heard me lecture in 1995 at Cambridge University, St. John's College at Cambridge in England. Heard me lecture on the dietic model, which I present in the way of explore. <clears throat> he said, I think we've on to something that kind of validates what you're saying. Can we talk? So we went to lunch together. And he explained to me, and he'd heard me lecture on the dietic model, which is an information uh, energy model. And he said, I think we've discovered exactly what validates your model. And he started telling me about the quantum hologram. And after listening to him talk and thinking about it for a week or so, I wrote him back and I said, hey, guys, how about knocking off the building better quantum computers, let's go solve the problem of consciousness. I think you found a very key ingredient. And since it had been validated already in the <clears throat> tomography uh, experiments and improvements, we already were a leg up. We didn't have to go devise new experiments to validate what we were talking about. We just had to find some more usage of it. So what we realized that we were talking about is nature's own version of holography. We created, 40 years ago almost, laser holography, classical laser holography. The reason this is called holography is it obeys many of the same rules that we have used and discovered in creating holograms uh, with laser, with laser light and with splitting a beam, putting it back together, and so forth. So many of the characteristics of a classical hologram are indigenous and a part of the way nature has structured itself, and we've just discovered it. And what are the properties of a quantum hologram that make it so exciting? Well, first of all, it operates by phase conjugate adaptive resonance. For everybody in this room, the last word is the important one, resonance. For mathematicians and physicists in the room, the first three words are important. Phase conjugate adaptive. Uh, we'll concentrate on the word adaptive for a moment. What that means is that to order to perceive the signal and utilize the information, you have to have an adaptive sensor. And I'll tell you how that works in a little while. <clears throat> but <clears throat> phase conjugate, just to kick on it for a minute, what is PCAR, phase conjugate adaptive resonance? It's simply a mathematical term describing how resonance takes place. And it's the same type of resonance in principle we talk about. If you pluck a violin string here, and a similarly tuned violin string across the room starts to resonate or move in harmony with the string. It's the same type of resonance. Now, resonance mathematically, in this sense, if you have a wave moving in this direction and an identical wave moving in this direction, you can describe those as a standing wave. In other words, it seems like nothing is moving, they're just standing there. So if I shake hands with you, Who's shaking hands? No, we're both shaking hands. Not one or the other. We're both shaking hands. And both are moving together. That's a standing wave. Okay? Or if you take a jump rope, and both of you are shaking it and holding it the same, and you get a wave in there, that is a standing wave would be two resonant phase conjugate waves moving against each other so that they appear as a standing wave. That is resonance. And this is just mathematical lingo to help us understand that. But anyhow, it's a very, very important term. The information we're talking about is carried in the phase relationships. Now, this has been a, a no-no for 75 years. Quantum physicists didn't think information was carried in the phase relationship, but we're going to show you that that's true. Let me give you a lighthouse, a metaphor. It's called the lighthouse metaphor <clears throat> to help understand this concept. Very important to all of us. If you're walking on the seashore at night, 
and in a fog settled on the bay. But you see on the scintillating wave-covered bay out here, you see lights reflected from something in the distance that you can't see because of the fog. If the fog were to be lifted, you could see a lighthouse over there shimmering on the waves. But you can't see the lighthouse and the waves. You can just see scintillating light. In principle, if you knew all the waveforms, you could still the waves and see the image of the lighthouse reflected in the water if it were smooth like a mirror. How in principle do you still the waves? Well, if you knew the wave equations and how the waves interacted because the interaction is their phase relationship, if you could still the waves, you could see it. In principle, can you do that? Well, the answer is yeah. All of the modern high-powered telescopes that we use to look at the heavens use exactly that principle. They shoot a beam of laser light into the heavens, catch the reflections from the air, uh, atmosphere molecules and waves in the, that causes the light to scintillate. The reflections come back down, it's corrected on a computer uh, program, and lo and behold, it makes the light coming in from the atmosphere very clear. What they're doing is correcting the phase relationships and the wave equations of the motion in the air to get the light to be clear and not distracted and distorted by the atmosphere. That's exactly the principle we're talking about. And indeed, so the information, as in a classical hologram, which is carried in the wave front, the interference front of the waves, information is carried in a quantum hologram in the phase, in a phase relationship. And it turns out that the brain can act as a phase gate in a similar way and decipher the information in the quantum hologram when you're in phase conjugate adaptive resonance with the source of the hologram. So, it operates by phase conjugate adaptive resonance. It carries the complete history of the physical object that emitted the hologram, the quanta. It's carried non-locally. Elizabeth Rauscher was hammering on the notion of non-locality. Quantum hologram is a non-local structure, which means that the information is carried out through the universe. It also has the property of distributedness, such that a little portion of the hologram has all the information. It goes non-locally. What is happening with the quantum hologram it's the macro scale equivalent of the quantum correlation that physicists discovered 75 years ago with regard to subatomic particles. <clears throat> and Einstein and others dismissed as being spooky action at a distance. It was only put into a testable form in 1966 by John Bell at CERN Laboratory only decisively tested in 1982 by Alan Aspect and a team of physicists in Paris. That indeed, non-locality and spooky action at a distance is really valid, real stuff. And it has now been used to teleport photons and tiny particles over 400 kilometers and validated completely in the laboratory. And sorry, Dr. Einstein, you were just wrong on this one. But that is how the quantum hologram works. It's one of its fundamental properties. And I submit to you, it is the reason that we experience all of our psychic effects non-locally. We have got experiment after experiment after experiment 
showing non-local effects, but never a mechanism to say how is the information carried. Here's a mechanism that carries the information non-locally. And the information is recoverable through resonance. That's the way the MRI machine <coughs> was set up. And if you happen to know any of the physics and the mathematics of an MRI machine, you know that you're dealing with a resonance. <coughs> okay. More properties. What comes out of the formalism? It's time irreversible. In other words, a quantum hologram that is produced by a physical object doesn't go back. It's not lost. It's time irreversible. There is no time symmetry in the equations. There's no real energy loss because the energy loss is being replaced continuously by quantum fluctuations from the zero point field. And further, it confirms chaos theory arrow of time. In other words, there is a unique evolutionary history associated with each quantum hologram, which means each one of us and each thing is unique in and of itself. No two physical objects can occupy the same space simultaneously. Therefore, it cannot have a simultaneous or identical history. And if it has a quantum hologram carrying the event history, then each one has to be unique in its path, in its life path, in its history. It also confirms that we live in a 3D spatial universe plus time. There's been a lot of talk about multiverses, multi-universes, etc. There's quite a bit of theory that shows macro scale quantum effects cannot happen in more than four dimensions. <clears throat> Presumably it can happen at the, at the quantum level, but we, haven't do, we do not have any physical proof of that. It's elegant mathematics. The uh, <clears throat> Riemann geometry that Einstein used is elegant mathematics, very sophisticated, very complex, very beautiful, but does it conform to nature? We don't have any proof of that at all. But we do have proof here that at the macro scale level, these quantum effects that we're talking about cannot exist in more than four dimensions. So <clears throat> nature is primarily as we see it to be, and there's a good reason for that, which we'll go into in a few minutes. Those of you who know a little bit of physics, <clears throat> it fairly well demonstrates that the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum physics, which said at that level it's all probability, <clears throat> and the many worlds interpretation of quantum theory, which says <clears throat> at that level every choice branches the universe, those are flawed theories are not correct. And that should be demonstrated. In fact, it's already been demonstrated to the satisfaction of the colleagues and the peer, people who have peer-reviewed what I'm talking about. What it does validate is the extended transactional interpretation, which says, essentially, there are real physical processes taking place at the quantum level, not just mathematics. It's not just a mathematical model. It is real stuff there. It's energy flowing. What are the major implications that we're talking about here? All physical matter has quantum attributes. The quantum properties, in other words, are not just for subatomic matter, as has been insisted upon for three quarters of the last century, for 75 years since the beginning of quantum physics. <clears throat> it's been assumed since Einstein said the moon doesn't go away when you close your eyes, and that's what quantum probability would <clears throat> predict. We're now beyond that. He was wrong, of course, in one sense. The moon doesn't go away when you close your eyes. On the other hand, there's a tiny, finite probability that it might. But finding the quantum hologram is showing that is missing the point. 
The point is that the quantum properties of macroscale matter are represented by the quantum hologram itself. So the quantum hologram is the wave nature of, for macroscale matter of the famous wave particle duality which spawned quantum mechanics in the beginning. So <clears throat> let's talk about it in this way. We're not talking about subatomic particles, infinitesimal things. We're talking about real stuff here. And we have associated with this real stuff a wave attribute which obeys virtually the same quantum rules that the wave particle duality does at the subatomic level. However, we're talking about macro scale stuff. So essentially what it's saying, we live in a quantum universe. Now this has been debated for 75 years, but we never found the mechanism here. And it is an information carrying mechanism, and that's wow. <clears throat> Elizabeth Rauscher said the other day, I believe, I wasn't here all the time, <clears throat> but this attribute of non-locality that we were talking about is precisely what the mystic has said for a thousand years or so, the universe is somehow mysteriously interconnected. Einstein said it was spooky action at a distance and that can't exist. Sorry, it does exist. That's the way the universe is structured. <clears throat> what it also is telling us, beneath all our classical descriptions of nature, there are quantum processes at work. <clears throat> now let's just take the medical profession for example, and I don't want to gore anybody's ox here, but we've been trying to get the medical profession for at least 30 years to look beneath the chemical model of treating the body and peddling more pills and to look at the electromagnetic, the quantum, or what's turned, what we would normally call complementary or alternative medicine. And I am very much convinced that most of those techniques are rooted right in the level that we're talking about. So getting beneath those, that chemical model that we've used and had for almost a century now of how the body works <clears throat> to understand and explore the electromagnetic and, and quantum effects is really what this is all about. Because the QH is likely responsible <clears throat> for most of these subtle energy, numinous effects that we know happen in humans, we just don't have a good explanation for. We haven't discovered those energies, the chi, the, the zero point field, all of these things. But the first place we ought to look is with this quantum effects and the interaction of the electromagnetic and the quantum with the macro scale chemical. We'll find very strange inter, uh, interactions here. Just like you've heard about electromagnetic interference, you can't, you can't uh, do your cell phone or run your computer when you're in an airplane and it's taking off because of the electromagnetic radiation interactions and interference. <clears throat> Much of what we're seeing, probably in the human aura and these other so-called astral bodies and uh, effects associated with the human body, the human thought, and these are uh, very likely associated with quantum effects or the interaction of quantum effects, chemical effects, and electromagnetic magnetic effects. We need to explore that and see if that's the answer. If not, then we have to look for something else. But to me, right now, that is the most likely candidate to explain all the subtle effects that we've been seeing. Okay. Remote viewing by QH, what is it? <clears throat> the object to be viewed, since all physical objects, according to this theorem, emits a non-local quantum hologram, which goes rippling off through the universe in the zero-point field. The viewer must have an icon to create a resonance with the object. So all of you remote viewers, uh, Either you've got to have a name, a set of coordinates, a sock, a uh, piece of clothing, uh, uh, some article that helps you identify with the object to be a remote view. You've got to hone in. In other words, that's your receiver. You dial the dial, and okay, you get tuned in. 
You have to have a way to do that. And the more in tune the resonance, the more complete the information. <clears throat> now, if our modeling of the quantum hologram is correct, when I say more in tune, it is not just the brain that gets in tune, although that's fundamental. The more you can get in tune, you can get the whole body or whole significant portions of the brain body in tune. And the more you get in tune and the better you are at it, uh, the more complete the information you can pull out of the remote object. But let's understand something here. <clears throat> The quantum information is never complete in itself. We can never totally, as you know, with any sort of intuitive information, you need to have a space-time confirmation of that to build your competence to really get the information. Quantum information, based in the particle theory, is mostly spin correlation. That is what is, uh, uh, at the particle level, that is what is non-local, it's spin correlation. Well, it's a little more complicated at that at the level of macro scale objects, but it is rather clear that all information, total information, <coughs> is not carried there, else we wouldn't need the normal senses. It is complementary information. So you're always going to need to hone your intuition with real time, space time, physical, sensory information. And the more you do that, the more you can rely upon it. However, in this theory, if the upper limit to resonance should result in an out-of-body experience, if the body is so totally in resonant with a remote object, you should feel like you're right there. Now, there's some reasons within the within the mathematical formalism of the quantum hologram that makes us believe that. It is page specific. In other words, it's, it doesn't get mixed up. It is very specific information. Noise tends to make it more clear and more definitive. So there's some very good technical mathematical reasons why what I'm saying is true. And the more you get focused and in tune with more of the brain body organism, involved with the project itself, you could very well feel a total out-of-body experience. Now, I'm going to tell you about a surprising case history that's come out of this. How many in this room have heard of the Delawire machine from England? A few of you. George Delawire was an engineer back in the 40s and 50s, a British engineer. His wife was uh, a remote viewer. I called him her sensitive then. And very, very good. And he was determined to try to get science involved with this 60 years ago. And he was successful. But of course, he was way, way ahead of his time. He got laughed out of the scientific establishment, called a fraud, uh, cheating, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But he, nevertheless, he continued his work. Just in the last year and a half, uh, some of that work has been revisited. A group has <coughs> bought the, has purchased the uh, Delaware Labs, <coughs> and one of the things that remained in the lab <coughs> were about 9,000 slides from the 1940s and 50s period, glass slides that the Delaware machine. Now, what he had concocted was a series of dials and things to help his wife, who was the initial, who was the initial operator or sensitive, get in tune with or resonate with the object. And he did many, many thousands of tests on everything from simple materials, elements, uh, chemist, uh, chemical elements, to human beings, animals, disease, health, and so forth. He ran thousands and thousands of tests, and he had about, during the period, about 13,000 different slides that he had made of his tests, of which around 9,000 were left. And what he did, <clears throat> one, some of the tests, uh, a whole series of them, not too much to describe tonight. But of course, some of the tests used an icon, a drop of blood, a hank of hair, or something, uh, for the operator to resonate with, and then they would take a picture. 
Well, it was just a normal 2D slide, they thought. We had uh, one of my colleagues that was helped writing this paper, a lady by the name of Sue Benford, had these 2D, some of these 2D slides analyzed using three-dimensional analysis modern computer software, which wasn't invented until 15 or 20 years ago. Lo and behold, what jumped out as they used the software was three-dimensional encoding of the object that was the specimen of the subject. <clears throat> and you could turn it like in a, any 3D image on a computer and look at it from all angles, etc. Wow. This is totally mind-blowing. If nothing else, it validated that Delaware, whatever his machine did, some said his machine was a fake, you know, they didn't accept that mind was involved with it. Nevertheless, this showed that something worked. And that what worked is he was capturing on a photographic plate three-dimensional encoded images of a remote subject that only had an icon here to create the resonance. That is not only remote viewing, but that's PK involved. Creating a video, rather a glass plate film, and with a specimen, an icon, and one of the classic ones we looked at was a wire in a cow's stomach who was sick. And uh, <clears throat> wanted the dealer wires to diagnose what's wrong with my cow. Well, they obviously didn't bring the cow into the laboratory. They brought a, a sample, a specimen. And we could take 50 years later that slide, put it on a computer analysis, turn it around like you were looking at it in real life. It was submitted to, for independent analysis to MRI experts <coughs> at one of the leading universities here, double blind, they didn't know what they were looking at. I said, that's the best MRI image I've ever seen, but how did you get those slices so perfectly? Wasn't MRI slices at all, it was a single slide with three-dimensional encoding. Ladies and gentlemen, the only thing that could done, have done that in modern theory is a quantum hologram. It's the only thing that carries the information and has a distributed property so that the entire information was carried in a drop of blood. Am I getting my point across? That experiment alone was a combination of remote viewing and PK. In the slide analysis, you can modern software produced 3D encoding on standard two-dimensional slides. So a new thing is coming out of here, out of this quantum <coughs> holographic theorizing and experimental work. First of all, our classical theory of, of perception is a gross oversimplification and is simply incomplete. The classical theory says, you know, our five normal senses are sound, sight, taste, touch, and smell. But QH, QH suggests that both classical and quantum information is utilized for perception, that it takes both. And if we're evolved species and perception evolved along with the rest of the complexity in the universe, <clears throat> this non-locality as a ubiquitous information system was around long before planetary environments that allowed sights, sound, smell, touch, and so forth to have evolved. So we would say, and I have written a paper given two years ago, peer-reviewed in Belgium, called Nature's Mind, the Quantum Hologram, which explores exactly this issue, that the basis of subjective experience and perception is non-locality. Therefore, we can say that the brain creates the PCAR condition with the object by phase gating, as it were, the quantum holographic information and the space-time signaling coming in through the normal sensory channels. A way to think about this, 
If I snap my fingers, or you snap your fingers here, where do you hear the sound? You don't hear it in here. You hear it as though it's out here. Well, how in the world does that happen? That's what phase conjugate adaptive resonance means. The brain creates, as it were, a virtual signal. And it's the only way you can mathematically model this distance that you hear out here, or reality that we see things where they are in the Cartesian theater of our existence. <clears throat> it's not because of binocular vision, although that enhances the effect. It's because like bats, like <clears throat> dolphin, like side-looking radar, we put out a virtual signal instead of a real physical signal and echo it back and measure the wave phase relationships in order to see where things are. Why is that important? because we're in an evolving universe and survival depends upon it. If we, didn't, if we weren't able to perceive our reality the way it is, we couldn't survive. The survival advantage goes to the species that perceives and moves in its environment the best. So we have to have these mechanisms. We're just now starting to understand from the quantum level what is the way these mechanisms work? <clears throat> it's also helping us see that the brain is a massively parallel quantum computer, which has been denied for quite a number of years that the brain is too hot to do quantum processes. Nonsense. If we can do it with MRI machines, where they're a hell of a lot hotter than a brain at times, then it's not too hot. In other words, some of the ideas of quantum processes working at, <clears throat> at the quantum level, the subatomic level, are falling by the wayside very, very rapidly right now. They're simply wrong. And it seems that <clears throat> a way the brain does this, and this is a metaphor. We're not, the work of uh, Stuart Hameroff, Roger Penrose, are very germane to this notion of microtubules. But as you tie it into quantum holographic theory, that the microtubules of the brain act like, metaphorically, an organ pipe that creates a standing wave in the microtubule that we interpret and perceive as a sensory information associated with that particular sense, whether any of one, any one of the five senses works the same in that regard. Possible new discoveries coming up from the quantum holographic work. One of the most exciting is that the physical matter is a self-referencing quantum system. Well, what does that mean? It will mean a lot more to mathematicians and physicists than perhaps the rest of us. <clears throat> but holographically, you know about a hologram. If, if these guys down here on the strip and their shows want to create a holographic image on the stage, they have to have a reference signal that decodes a two-dimensional hologram and thereby creates a three-dimensional image on the stage for you. Or if your car dealer wants to show you a new automobile but he doesn't have one really in stock, so he shows you a holographic image, he has to have a reference signal that projects it into a three-dimensional reality. So you can see it, but you can't touch it. You can put your hand through it. The quantum hologram is kind of the same thing. It's an image carrying information, a distributed image. But one of the big problems in quantum physics is what's the reference? They haven't really concerned themselves too much with phase. All of a sudden now we're interested in phase. What is the reference? It turns out each individual physical object is its own reference. What does that mean? It's its own zero point. Used to graphing something, you have to have a datum. X, Y coordinates and a zero point. Every physical object is its own zero point for the emission of the quantum holographic waves. This has some ver a very powerful implication, and some of you may understand this word, certainly physicists and mathematicians will. It seems to solve this notion of self-referencing, seems to solve a very thorny problem 
in cosmology and quantum physics called renormalization. And I've touched this with this to a couple of people in the community, and they say, wow, if that really works, you've explained something very powerfully. And we now know the reason for that. It has to do with this phase problem, that if you didn't, that the phase was arbitrary, and we had an arbitrary constant in many physical equations that you had to subtract out arbitrarily to make the numbers come out right. They didn't know why. It said something's wrong with the mathematics, but never one, no one ever knew what. Now it appears it has to do with the quantum hologram and the arbitrary phase of a self-referencing system. If you say it's a self-referencing system, you know how to subtract out this arbitrary constant. Out of all of this, it is totally consistent with the idea when you think of a divine universe and such creating, learning, evolving universe. God sleeps in the minerals, awakens in plants, walks in the animals, and thinks in man, which comes from a very ancient Sanskrit proverb. Thank you very much. You've been a wonderful audience.